Wonderful. Welcome to the second installment of Conversations on Culture. This afternoon, I was so elated to introduce our guest, our second guest ever. Um, this is Gwendolyn Hatton Butler. She is an incredible uh, finance executive, philanthropist, and art collector. So today, our conversation will be focused on her collection and just her journey in terms of how she's collected, why she collects, and just the works that move her. So. Well, happy to join you this afternoon and thanks everyone for taking time out of your busy days uh, to, uh, to hang with us for a little while this afternoon. Appreciate it. Awesome. So um, I just wanna talk with you a little bit about, I know we had just a, a short preliminary conversation on Tuesday. Um, so I just wanna talk with you about your background and what has led you into collecting. Jeez, all right, so my background, just um, I was born and raised in Detroit and always had um, a focus on arts and culture that was initially, um, you know, kind of sparked by school, uh, you know, going to the museums as, you know, it's part of an elementary school trip, uh, finding refuge uh, in the library uh, at a very young age and just, um, not being artistically inclined myself, uh, being more, you know, I don't, don't typically use kind of that, that side of my brain mm. uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but definitely appreciating um, art and culture and, you know, um, understanding that it brings a certain aspect to my life that's very joyful. Awesome. Uh, and so uh, I, you know, started, you know, probably collecting, quote unquote, collecting art in high school, buying black light posters. And for those of you of a certain generation, you might know what those are. Um, and then when I went to college. I'm sorry, uh, wait, can we go back? What, what are those? <laughs> I'm <laughs> oh, <you> know, sorry. <laughs> so sorry. black light posters were very popular in Detroit in the 60s and 70s. So I'm giving my vintage. And uh, the thing about a black light poster is that you could really see it under fluorescent lights. Ah. So if you think about, uh, for example, the artists in the Afro-Cobalt movement and the colors yeah. that they use, it's kind of an extension of the coloration that you would see in a black light poster if it was uh, you know, shown under a fluorescent light. Uh, and if you go back and look at old videos of the Parliament Funkadelics, George Clinton, Bootsy, um, you know, in the backdrop, they typically would have like black, black light posters. Uh, so those were plastered all over my wall, my bedroom walls when I was in high school. And when I went to college, um, you know, becoming engaged in the art scene in Ann Arbor, you know, it was an annual art fair uh, every year that we would just kind of walk to, through and dream. Maybe one day we might be able to afford some of these artworks. And then, you know, meeting um, a young graduate student uh, when I was there as an undergrad by the name of George Nanami, who was one of the pioneering Black gallerists. And just, um, you know, listening to George and becoming uh, more attuned to um, art from the African diaspora. And I always say that if I had started buying art when uh, you know, George Nanami was encouraging all of us to, you know, my collection would just be, you know, extraordinary. Staggering, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you have an extraordinary collection now. I think we should say that. But I think what you mean is it would be a little bit more robust because the collection that you have has six decades worth of contemporary and modern art. Well, so that's... Yeah, that's true. I think, you know, when I uh, became of age and uh, kind of, you know, as I progressed through life, sort of stop accumulating things and start thinking about um, what could I do to, uh, I'll use the term invest, but not from a monetary sense, but, you know, what can I do to invest in things and objects that would be, um, mentally pleasing to me, mm -hmm. it reflected, it turned me back to kind of the arts and culture, uh, my interest in arts and culture. And so I think probably the, the 
first piece of quote unquote fine art that I acquired was probably in 1997, 1998. And that was at Andy Warhol's silk screen, silk screen of Muhammad Ali. Yes, um, if you give me a moment, I wanna pull that up so that sure. we have a look. And so while you're pulling it up, what I, what I, what I, uh, yeah, my, my collection is very robust and it spans 60 years in terms of the age of the works and we can talk about that. But, you know, George uh, Nanami and other pioneering gallerists like, like such as George were really pushing the work of folks of like Ed Clark, Richard Mayhew, um, you know, artists Lane, uh, Norman Lewis and Romare Bearden, Jacob Lawrence. Um, Alma Thomas, and you know, you could have purchased an original Romare Bearden for three hundred dollars. So, uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like so, <laughs> and, and so, uh, in coming from Detroit, which has uh, a multi generational uh, history of Black folks collecting Black arts, if you think about the art collections, and they were uh, actually the Detroit. Um, Museum of Art uh, just had uh, a, uh, the Detroit Institute of Arts just had a major exhibition of art uh, from the home of, of, of Detroit collectors. And it was African-American art from the home of um, Detroit collectors. And some of those collections, the artworks back, uh, you know, date back to the 1800s. And, um, and those individuals have been collecting art for like, you know, six, seven, eight decades. Wow. And I think that's a, such a rich legacy to tap into, particularly as it relates to the position of Black artists and this, this, um, this narrative that we continue to see being put forward that our engagement in this space is new, when in fact, of course, you know, there's so much evidence to the contrary. So I'm just sharing one of the images that you shared with me from your collection. Um, which is this Ed Clark. I know you've mentioned him already so far, so I just wanted to share with the people. Um, did you want to tell us about the very first work that you purchased? Yeah, so the very first work that I purchased was, uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, silkscreen of Muhammad Ali. I it was in San Francisco and, you know, on Gary Street at the time uh, in the 90s, all, the, all of the um, galleries were located, a lot, a number of the galleries were located on Geary Street, and I always stayed at the hotel, the Clift Hotel, which is still there, and so, you know, walking from Union Square to the hotel, I would walk through the gallery district. One of the things that I've always liked to do um, is to go to museums and galleries in downtime when I travel, um, and so just kind of wandering in and out of the galleries, I wandered into a gallery and saw this work, um, now this is 1980, excuse me, 1997. So, you know, Andy Warhol was known, but he hadn't really taken off. Mm -hmm. No one wanted prints. And, and doing my research, what I realized that uh, at one point in his career, Andy Warhol was commissioned to do a series of original works by an avid sports fan. And so, these prints of Muhammad Ali, and there are actually four images in the suite, were done by Andy, um, along with other work, other images of people like, you know, Jimmy Connors, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, um, Chris Everest, Everett. Um, and so this particular image just, it just like struck me. Uh, because he, he appears to be very contemplative. And mm -hmm. one of the things about uh, my art collection, which is a bit different, is that I'm drawn towards abstract works. Mm -hmm. And so even though this is not an abstract work, it, it has abstract qualities to me uh, because it's not a full kind of front on yeah. portrait or figure. Mm -hmm. And so this was the very first work that I, uh, purchased and you know when I wrote the check it kind of took my breath away a little bit but um, because I had never written a check that large 
for anything outside of uh, a down payment for a condominium that I was living in at the time. Uh, but uh, in, in retrospect, it's like one of the best acquisitions I've ever made. And, and I've never acquired anything, uh, and you and I talked about this, yes. from the perspective of it appreciating in value because that's just a crapshoot. You don't know, like who knew that in, you know, 2019, uh, you know, this same image would be uh, at, you know, various museums around the country as part of a retrospective on Andy Warhol works. Um, you know, so I'd never buy anything thinking it's gonna appreciate because I don't know. Um, I'm sorry, someone is distracting me. <laughs> I bet I know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> but I, he, just, he just gave me a note, but I can't read his handwriting, so I don't know what this means. <laughs> it's like a little uh, moment. That's Dr. right. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, in any event, I'm sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought, but okay. I just, uh, I, I, I never buy anything thinking it's going to appreciate. Um, it's, uh, it's just... Um, I, I buy things and, and, and look at the value as, is this a fair price given the work that the artist has put into the work? Which I love so much. And uh, so from that perspective, um, this is, uh, you know, this is kind of a breathtaking moment at the time, some 22 years ago. Uh, you know, this work now lives with my daughter in San Francisco, so uh, she gets to enjoy it, but um, it, it's, you know, it's brought us, you know, much pleasure um, in the time that, that we've owned this work. Stunning. Okay, so from there, you said that so much of your work is things that are less on the figurative side and, and leaning more toward abstraction. Um, yes. Is there something in particular that you want to move on to in terms of what we look at next? Well, let's go to that Ed Clark that you had up. Okay. Um, yeah, this is just classic Ed. Yeah, it really is a stunning, stunning work. Bear with me a moment. So this is dry pigment on paper. And I apologize for the image. I was pulling these off my phone. So these are not professional photographs, but I think it does a pretty good job of really, and this is one of his works from the 90s. Um, I mean, the way that he just, um, his imagery and the energy, I see energy in this work. And I see energy in all the abstract works that I own. The first thing that appeals to me when I am contemplating an acquisition is whether or not it has kind of abstract energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this, this piece has just a lot of movement. I'm not sure if the picture um, if the image really, you know, if you can really pick that up, but just kind of, you know, how he's, you know, blended various hues of, mm -hmm. of the pigment and um, it's, uh, I mean, it's just a, a very interesting, uh, very kind of, you know, soul pleasing work to me. And I also think that if I, um, to characterize what draws me to abstraction is just, um, the artists, can, how, how they can take um, something that, that, that is very conceptual and express it in a way uh, that has no form, quote unquote, no quote unquote form, but in fact, it has lots of form. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that's, you know, this is just a lay person talking on that. No, I think, I actually think <laughs> very succinct. <laughs> So, uh, and, and the other thing about this work, um, just for, you know, those who, and I, I learned everything, I learned something new every time I go to an art show, uh, every time I go to an exhibition, every time I go to a gallery, every time I go to a museum. Uh, so this has been a, since 1998, uh, a journey of just learning every day um, with every kind of artistic experience I had. And so when I originally acquired this work, it was not behind museum glass. And mm. um, a friend came into my home one day and said, you know, you might wanna, you know, get this, not necessarily reframe because I love the frame, 
but you know, just you know, basically upgrade the glass on here because mm -hmm. where, it's, where it's positioned in your home is not in direct sunlight, but, but it may fade over time. And so I had the work taken out, brought, you know, and I had museum glass dropped in. Good friend. And, one of the, and then one of the things I realized when they hung it, I'm like, oh my God, there's green in this work because regular glass uh, basically absorbed the green in the work. But the museum uh -huh. glass allowed the green to come through. So you can really see on the left-hand side of my screen, yeah. the green. And I, I had owned this work for a number of years and had never seen that green. Oh, wow. So, um, yeah, so I, I listened to my friends that are avid art collect collectors. And, and you know, one of the things that you know, I want to make sure even though I'm not necessarily expecting appreciation, I want to make sure that the works can be enjoyed in a way and should can be viewed in a way in which the artist intended them to be viewed. Yes. And yes. so, and so that that requires me to either, if the artist is living, talk to the artist. I remember Kennedy Yanko came to my home, I own one of her tabletop works, and um, she came in and she looked at the work and she adjusted it. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we just wanted to move on to her image. Sure. Okay. Um, and that one is actually a shared image. Um, so it's more than just her work in that. Yeah, so this Kennedy's work is uh, on the uh, chest uh, to the right. And um, it's interesting. I actually quite acquired this work at auction. And that's another, um, you know, kind of thing that you and I talked about, kind of the difference between, you know, buying from a gallery, buying at auction, buying directly from the, um, you know, from the artist. And so I was really very fortunate to acquire this piece uh, yeah. because, I, it, as it turned out, it was a very attractive acquisition given uh, you know, her kind of quote unquote retail prices. And it, it was just something that I just kind of found in an auction uh, for a cultural institution in New York. Uh, she had donated the work to support the cultural institution. Um, and it made me very happy when I said to her, uh, oh, you know, I was able to acquire your work at auction. And she said, well, I'm really happy that you own my work. So that, that also made me feel good. That's I wanted to support piece. her. It's a beautiful week piece. And I don't know if she's done very many of these on Marvel. I don't know if you can tell, but you know, the work is kind of her acrylic skin is on Marvel, uh, right. which is, um, you know, she's a lot of her work that we might, others might be familiar with are the skins on um, metal, which are just extraordinary. Um, but for me, because I live in a condo and have limited wall space, uh, you know, I, I would, you know, I'm all oftentimes challenged because of the size of the works that the artists are producing. Even though I may love the work, it just doesn't fit in my space. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so I was very happy that I was able to acquire this lovely, lovely, beautiful, very unique work by Kennedy. And, and this is when you walk into my home, this is what you see when you walk in. And so when she walked in, she walked over and kind of, it's two pieces of marble and she turned the top piece uh, because I guess I had it backwards, but. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what a like beautiful moment. <laughs> That's great. I think one of the, the things that is coming out to me is, as you're speaking is just this journey of discovery that seems to be inherent in this process for you. Oh, absolutely. It's very joyful. Uh, the piece that accompanies it uh, is a print, because I will buy prints. Um, this is from the Afrocoba movement, an artist by the name of Wadsworth Gerald. And the original is owned, uh, and this is called Revolutionary. It's an image of, Watts, of uh, Angela Davis. And you know, it's not necessarily clear in this picture, but all of those colors are words. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you can stand in front of this work mm -hmm. um, for an hour, just kind of tracing various slogans like you know revolution resist you know if i die in the struggle it will not be for vain uh you know um, in the upper uh, i'm looking at the image now in the upper right hand 
corner of it, you can see revolt, you can see re resist. Yes, absolutely. And I, I mean, I, it's just, it's just extraordinary. The, the original in the Brooklyn Museum is uh, obviously much larger than the, um, than the prints. I think he uh, allegedly made 300 of them, although um, I've been told that the, the 300 actually weren't produced. Mm. Um, but the original, if you look at her eyes, yeah, uh, it, 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 her eyes just leap out of the unique work. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's just, it's extraordinary. It really is. It's just really extraordinary. So, and another thing I like to do is to, is to pair artists. And so, um, you know, pairing Kennedy with Wadsworth, you know, both living artists, uh, But, and, and even though these aren't the same, they, in my mind, they very much complement each other sure. from, a, from a visual perspective. And, um, you know, in my home, uh, if you come in my home, there's kind of a long hallway that's kind of gallery-like. And so the works in that hallway are very different than, let's say, the works in the kind of combined living room, dining room, kitchen area. Um, not that, you know, I'm drawn to certain colors mm -hmm. so i'm not trying to do, be matchy matchy sure but but there are themes um from an Im imagery perspective uh that i believe complement each other so i i just really when i walk in this is what i see and i just really love this this combination yeah i think um there's a lot there's a lot to be said about that combination um i think it's a lot more subtle than people may imagine um, just in terms of what the the two of them are doing with form and paint, mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting combination. Um, would you like to move on? Just since you're speaking about pairings, would you like to move on to the Ed Clark and Caroline Kent image? Oh, absolutely! Yeah. That's my newest pairing. Oh, <laughs> okay. And here we go. So, Caroline Kent brilliant young Caroline um, in Chicago now. We're so thrilled to have her in Chicago, uh, her and her husband, Nate Young. Um, Caroline is on the right and um, she works in abstraction. Her strokes are just beautiful. Uh, and, uh, it, and I hope if she's listening, she would take this as a compliment you know, not necessarily this particular work, but I have seen other works that she's done and, and particularly the larger scale works um, that in my mind, uh, the strokes are fairly reminiscent of Norman Lewis, which, uh, you know, Norman Lewis is one of the artists that got away from me <laughs> in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, when I first started collecting, I had a list and I was able to and I get the Ed Clarks and the Richard Mayhews, but you know, Norman Lewis, Alma Thomas, Barbara Chase Rabot, Martin Purrier were kind of some of the artists that I would love to own. Uh, but just, you know, um, by the time I got around to looking at their works, they were really, you know, uh, out of my price range, so to speak. Um, yeah. But it, it, you know, but her, so her work, is in my mind not a substitute for Norman Lewis, but there is there's so much energy and just her use of colors, particularly her works on paper with the black background, um, you know, just an extraordinary, um, extraordinary artist. And um, you know, I'm I'm you know this is you know a work that I acquired actually from your gallery. Uh, back in, uh, in, at Chicago Expo, um, and you know, uh, just a very few months later, uh, Caroline's work, one of her works, was acquired by the Art Institute of Chicago. So I'd like to say that I have, I discovered her before the Art Institute <laughs> folks did. Um, you know, I'm just just very happy to have her um, in my home, and you know, I just thought that there was something very synergistic about these two works together. I actually had another work um, in the place of uh, where Caroline's oh. work is hung. And so when I acquired it, I brought it home and I was looking for 
a place to put the work. And, and I just looked over in that corner and I said, oh, you know, I'm sorry, but I got to move. <laughs> I won't say what was there, but I got to move you because, you know, Caroline belongs here next to Ed. So, mm. um, and it just really, in my mind, it just really works really well. So if I may, I would like to pivot just a bit, mm -hmm. um, just because I think when we had our conversation one-on-one -on -one the other day, one of the things that I really wanted to tease out was the connection between your philanthropy and what you're doing within your collection, just these ideas about um, representation and the figure. And in this case, you're not, you're purposefully not directly connecting things that are connected to the body. Um, so I just want to talk about that in terms of the connections in your mind to that. So, um, you know, from a, a philanthropic and civic perspective, um, I've, you know, I've been drawn to education and youth. Um, you know, one of the things that I participate in uh, from a civic pers perspective is that I a commissioner on the community De community development commission for the city of Chicago, and so once a month I go to city hall and I'm commissioner Butler, and we approve, uh, you know, basically developments throughout the city. Uh, but you know, under Mayor Lightfoot, we're particularly focused on develop, you know, spurring real estate development in black and brown neighborhoods. And so, um, if I think about kind of where artists work, artists from the diaspora where they work, where they live where I work and live, um, you know, the, there's a, like a real synergy there between the creativity um, in those neighborhoods and, you know, anything that I can do that, to bring kind of resources to, the, to that neighborhood, either through my direct work as a real estate investor in my firm or through the work that I do as a member of the Community Development Commission or through the work that I do working with, um, you know, in Detroit, I'm a member of the Detroit Public School Foundation Board. And so we're providing support to students through the foundation. Uh, and in Chicago, I work with One Goal, which is, you know, uh, I, which identifies students who otherwise would be overlooked and who are um, then, you know, placed in a position where with intensive learning as well as um, counseling, they are able to go into college or pursue some type of trade career. Um, and so I'm, it, so I'm really focused on bringing resources to communities. Um, and I'm not sure if there, if that's a direct collect, a connection to uh, kind of, you know, my, my collect collection of art, mm -hmm. but I think there is. Hence why really? Well, well, really? Well, so, well, you know, I haven't thought about it that way. Okay. Um, it's just, uh, you know, I, I just find, I mean, I grew up in Detroit and mm -hmm. I grew up, um, you know, with all types of people and I did not grow up with an art collection in my home. <laughs> you know, working class parents, uh, you know, great providers provided lots of intellectual resources, but there was no money. So, um, you know, I'm kind of a first generation, not kind of, I am a first generation art collector. Um, you know, hopefully my daughter will, uh, you know, continue it on. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't, um, you know, it's not like I'm coming from a kind of a long line of folks that are, uh, you know, that have been in this space. Sure. In this sure. world. So, uh, you know, kind of learning the etiquette of collecting and uh, the uh, the etiquette of you know going to galleries, but but a lot of that has changed over time too. If I think about kind of the twenty years that I've been engaged as a participant uh, observer in the art world, uh, you know museums have become friendlier, mm -hmm. galleries have become friendlier. I think that's a direct reflection of the diversity that exists now on museum staffs and, um, you know, people that work at galleries and in the art world. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, I, I, and I also think that there's just a, a tremendous amount of creativity in neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. If you were in Detroit, I mean, the murals in the kind of the Grand River Quarter 
which is an area that has been abandoned by industry. But the artists have taken that corridor over and for literally, you know, almost two miles, the imagery on the buildings are just extraordinary. One of the things that my partner and I do when we travel, uh, we go on street art tours. And, you know, if you think about where street art is, they're mm -hmm. in neighborhoods that have been, you know, where disinvestment has taken place. For sure. But in fact, those neighborhoods are so vibrant because of the art. Yes. On the buildings. And, you know, there's parts in, in New York and Williamsburg, you know, we did a street arts tour that just, you know, the deeper we got into the neighborhood, kind of the more quote unquote derelict the buildings were in terms of their use. But oh my God, the vibrancy mm -hmm. in terms of the, the artwork was extraordinary. And we've seen that in Berlin, we've seen that in Paris, uh, we've seen it in Rome. Uh, you can see it you know, in the south side of Chicago, in Detroit. And so, you know, I'm able, I feel like I'm really fortunate that I'm able to, because I work in real estate, I'm out of the office, I'm out in neighborhoods, and I get a chance to experience kind of the vibrancy uh, that artists create in neighborhoods that would otherwise, you know, be considered, um, you know, places where you really wouldn't want to go uh, mm -hmm. because, because of the disinvestment, because of the corporate disinvestment that has taken place. Sure. So if I may mm -hmm. just kind of put this all together in a bow, because um, I think for me, as I'm listening to you speak, and as I'm thinking back on the conversation that we already had, I'm thinking about the ways that this abstraction is very much thinking about the spirit and animus that makes these communities what they are, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And so for me, there's a direct connection in terms of how I'm thinking about what you're doing, both through your professional work, through your philanthropy, and through your collection as well. So it's really about lifting that energy and that spirit of creativity and so you're doing that through multiple facets i don't know if you thought about it before well, no I mean, no i'm just kind of things. walking through life <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, no, but I, I i you know i i think i'm fortunate in that you know at this point in my life uh you know i feel like i've earned the right to kind of follow my interests and my passions and so um you know being able to combine kind of a professional interest in communities mm -hmm. with a uh, philanthropic interest, uh, with a civic engagement interest, as well as, you know, having uh, my interest in the arts all kind of come together mm -hmm. around um, not just the concept of space, but actual real spaces. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's, um, and I, you know, it's, it's amazing to me just, I take the train from Chicago to Detroit a lot. Um, and I've been doing that for the last couple of years. And so, you know, when you leave um, Union Station, downtown Chicago, and your train is kind of rolling through the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. you can see the disinvestment mm -hmm. uh, once you get past the, the ballpark, which used to be called Kaminsky Park, which I, I now think is US Cellular. When you roll into Detroit, uh, once you, uh, are headed east past Dearborn, you can see the disinvestment in terms of the, in, the industry has moved away, residential has moved away. But what you see in both cities, particularly in Detroit, is where kind of the creative community has come in mm -hmm. and, and basically revitalized those spaces on the exteriors. And so that, that, that gives the neighborhood hope, right? Yeah, kind of like the work that Amanda Williams did uh, with the you know the coloration of the the homes on the south side of Chicago before they were demolished. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, bringing um, so the creative folks have really really understand how you can bring life to areas where there has been d disinvestment from a corporate perspective, but the people and cultural investment is still there. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important way to think about that um, and an important way to consider the power and importance of art also in so because i think for many people art feels um distant and disconnected from an everyday experience in a certain way so i think it's really important to tie that together 
Um, so do you want to go through more images or whatever you like? This is okay. your time. <laughs> no, it's not. It's your time. No, no. Actually. Karen um, asked and I said, I had to say yes. So, <laughs> um, um, so we do have quite a few questions that were sent ahead of time. Okay. We do have a few questions that were posed, um, here in this chat box. So please feel free, you all, if you want to add more questions, please do that in the Q&A box, just because it will be a little bit easier for me to look at them. Um, so do you want to look at any? Sure. Okay, well, let's, actually, let's, let's go through some more images. Yeah, of, you know, yeah. I want to actually go and look at your Elizabeth Catlett. Um, because one of the things that I wanted to talk about with you today was just this focus on collecting women artists. So I think this is a good place to begin as well. So it's interesting, and I, I never really thought about it this way, but um, Naomi Beckwith from the MCA was at my home uh, some time ago, and she walked through, and she said to me, oh, Gwen, you know, you, you, there's a lot of, I don't see any male imagery here, <laughs> or work by men. And I'm like, well, that's not quite yeah, I said I never really thought about it that way. So to the extent I do have images in my home, they tend to be of women, which is uh, not anything that I've thought about overtly, but I guess it's just kind of turned out that way. Um, so uh, this Elizabeth Catlett was, you know, this actually is an example of kind of a, uh, the benefit of having, having great relationships with dealers. Uh, so this came to me directly from a dealer uh, that was serving as an intermediary of a client that was repositioning their uh, collection. Mm -hmm. And in talking to this dealer over time, uh, I this dealer knew that my initial focus, once I decided I would put money into collecting art, was on abstract um, contemporary artists from the African diaspora and that I had a list of artists that I wanted. So I wanted a Norman Lewis, I wanted a Alma Thomas, I wanted a Ed Clark, I wanted a Marissa Mayhew, I wanted a Richard Catlett. But um, a, a, a Catlett original work or a piece of sculpture was just out, outside of my um, my ability outside of my resource range. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this, this individual came to me and said that I have a client that has a limited, uh, i.e. this is one of 20 prints. Mm -hmm. And I think this might appeal to you even though it has a face, Gwen. <laughs> 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 and so when I saw it, I'm like, oh, I know it has a very abstract, you know, very energetic quality to it, even though, you know, there's no, there's no quote unquote smile, uh, although it's, it's, uh, this is a very, uh, this is someone to me that just appears to be really kind of, you know, very confident and, mm -hmm. um, and just the, the shading and the woodcut that was used to create the work. Absolutely. Uh, and I think about the work that, uh, that Elizabeth Catlett put into kind of creating the image, um, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's mind extraordinary. Blowing. Yeah. yeah, it's just extraordinary. Sure. And, and, and so, here. I'm sorry? The eyes in the figure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The eyes, the mouth. I mean, just the shading. You know, there's, there's a lot going on with, with this piece. Mm -hmm. really stunning. Um, and if we may switch gears a bit. Sure. Talking about um, women artists, but... I want to share one of your most recent acquisitions, if I may. Is that cool? That's sure, right. sure, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to switch screens. Oh, Lena. This is, I uh, actually spoke to the framer today, because <laughs> this one's still at the, at the framer. Uh, we're just, you know, like, uh, you know, can I come by even though we're in shelter in place? Uh, but, <laughs> Please but don't go outside case. of your no, house. No, 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 no. I mean, he's, he's, it's not happening. He was just calling just to touch base. Okay. Um, to let me know that it was ready when, um, 
when we, when we can all move around freely. So this was, you know, this was a very opportunistic purchase uh, <laughs> in the sense that I was actually trying to buy a digital print mm. for a fundraiser for Autograph, um, which is a uh, London-based organization that specializes in photographs by artists from the African diaspora. Mm -hmm. and, and so I sent an email, you know, I, I read, you know, on the weekends, Artsy and Mutual Art. And so I knew that there was, that they were putting together an exhibition of Lena Iris Victor, this, that's the artist. And, yeah. uh, and that as a fundraiser for the organization for Autograph, that there was gonna be a limited number of digital prints. And, you know, thinking I would never, ever be able to, you know, afford one of her unique works. Mm -hmm. I sent an email just saying, you know, hey, when you guys are ready to sell these prints, you know, how do I obtain one? And um, weeks later, I got an email back uh, actually from the curator of the ex ex exhibition, Renee, and she said, you know, we are, you know, just about ready to, you know, sell these prints these digital prints. And so, you know, you're definitely on the list. And oh, by the way, uh, Lena has created 15 unique works. Uh, well, you'll, well, let's put uh, unique prints. So three different images um, and five prints of each of the three images. So this has been hand gilded by her mm -hmm. and um, embellished a bit. And so each print is unique. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, I, you know, she said, I think, you know, this is via email. I think if you're interested, I think we may have one left out of the 15. I, I can and, imagine your face <laughs> reading this email. Well, I was afraid. To, I was like, well, how much does it cost? And, and mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, this is also one of those things where I said it's worth the investment. And so yeah. it was just timing. And, and so it took her a couple of days to get back to me and to, to check that they actually had the the, the work available. And it just so happened that of the three images and all three images are lovely, but this is the one that was available. And this is the one that I really liked of the three. And so it, it was just opportunistic because I was not, it was not something that was on my list to acquire because I thought uh, a, one of her works was unattainable, mm -hmm. um, you know, based on uh, just the, the success of the artist. Um, yeah. I've had the opportunity to, to meet Lena and she's just, you know, a, such an incredible, it's um, <laughs> just extraordinary. You know, one of the beautiful things about, um, for me in terms of the art world is the accessibility to the artists and just um, being able to talk with them to learn about their technique and what influences their work. Once again, that's, that's something that's very different than kind of what I do in my day job. Mm -hmm. And I just find it very interesting. And it's, um, I don't think that you're ever too old to learn. And mm -hmm. so this is uh, an aspect of my life where I'm still kind of learning uh, and it's very enjoyable. And it, I think it keeps me fresh. It keeps me current. Nice. Um, you know, um, despite my vintage. So it's, it's it, I just, I cannot wait until I actually, you know, I, it was in New York, it came to Chicago, it took a while to get here. I, you know, uh, Miriam Ibrahim was kind enough to facilitate the acquisition for me. And one of the beautiful things was, is that we went to London and actually saw um, her, Lena, installing the exhibition at Auto Autograph. We didn't interact with her. But uh, we got kind of a behind the scenes tour as the, from Renee, the curator of the exhibition as the work was being installed, the exhibition was being installed and it was, um, you know, just extraordinary. Um, we have a question from the audience about what the size of the piece is. Uh, so this is from her, I think, Dark, Dark Continent series. And so it's a little bit larger than the smaller images, um, if folks are familiar with that. So I think this image may be, I don't know, 12 by 14. Um, it's, it's a little bit larger than kind of the, the, the series, the works in the original series, uh, but it's, it's not a very large work, but it's, it's, I got the perfect spot for it. So 
you know, one of the things too, it's interesting, uh, a lot of artists work to scale, to size, and because I live in a condo and have limited wall space, I'm constantly looking for works that, um, where, I, where I can actually show the work. I am not a collector that buys work just to say I have it and it's not up on my walls. So everything that I own is, on a, is, on a, is, is, is hanging in my, in my uh, condo and I'm very sensitive to not wanting wanting the work to be seen. And so um, I think about that as I'm contemplating an acquisition as to kind of where, not only do I like the work, but you know, like where would I put it? And, and does it really fit? Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm not to the point where I'm buying works just to say that I you know, own a certain artist. I, if I buy a work, I want to enjoy it in my home. Wonderful. And I think if you are okay with it, um, that that can lead us into our Q and A because we have actually sure. questions to get through. Um, forgive me if I don't get to your question. I am trying my best. There's like I think about a dozen questions at this point. Sure. All right. So um, just based on that last question, I think um, I will lead into how do you determine your collecting list? Do you have people that you're watching? Are there, and this is actually a combination of maybe two people's questions. Mm -hmm. um, so part of it from Karen, hi Karen, and part of hi, it Karen. from uh, Janae Daria Strand. I hope you're joining us. Thank you for sending your question in ahead of time. Sure, thanks um, for the question. I actually do have a list of artists um, that I'm watching uh, for the opportunity to acquire. Um, and that list is constantly changing. Um, as I, you know, learn more and see more work by different artists. When I started collecting, and I think I've mentioned this a couple of times, I had, like I wanted, I didn't care how small it was. I had a list of artists. I wanted a unique work from like the apps, from the African-American abstract um, artists that had been neglected. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I got the Richard Mayhew, I kind of overachieved on Ed Clark, but I got Ed Clark. <laughs> um, you know, I have a, a Charles Alston. We actually didn't talk about the Alston work, which is the oldest work in my collection. We can. Yeah, we should show that because the collection spans um, 60 years. So it, it, the oldest work and this is the oldest work. It's an abstract by Charles Austin, which is interesting because he's not necessarily known um, in the literature for his abstract work, but he started out as an abstract artist. And this is from 1959. He was um, on the spiral with uh, yes. Bearden. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and this was actually interesting when I um, you know, started buying more work. This was a work that was offered at auction and it was a failed auction in that it did not meet the reserve. Mm. So I went back to the auctioneer and asked about the work. And uh, they said that the, um, the buyer, you know, the seller may be willing to an, entertain an offer. And so I made an offer and the, the seller accepted the offer, which is great. So, <laughs> um, yeah, this work is from 1959. Uh, the most recent works in my collection are two of the works that you've shown, uh, the work by Lena Iris Victor and the work by Caroline Kent. Those are both from 2019. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm very happy that I have kind of a, a work that is multi-generational mm -hmm. and, um, but still hangs together in that uh, I'm really, sticking with my love of abstraction and but appreciating how the interpretation by artists of abstraction have changed over time if i may mm -hmm. that that interpretation question makes me want to show um one more work. sure um basil if you're still here oh basil yes now's your time to shine basil oh my god <laughs> Um, I'm struggling. Hold just a minute. Okay, here we go. Um, these are just... All right, so this is, Basil didn't know me at the time, but this is me at the bar. I mean, I, I actually um, had acquired, and this is a work that I 
obtained from your gallery, I actually had acquired another work. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, this is his work, his collage work is just extraordinary. Um, and this is, it's so multi-layered that it's just, it's, his work is just incredible. And, and I guess these were, as I've come to learn, uh, earlier works in terms of this technique of um, collaging, uh, using collage and then making kind of unique images, photographs on aluminum. Um, so this was the first ba work by Basil that I acquired. And, you know, every time I look at this work, I see a different layer. Mm -hmm. So even though there are quote unquote people in the work or, you know, or images of individuals, um, in fact, this is very abstract to me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just the, the composition of it is, is extraordinary, uh, just in terms of the layering. So I acquired this piece and I said, oh, by the way, you know, let me, you know, look and see other works. And then I saw the other piece that you showed of the person, of the image of the, uh, I'm interpreting this as me sitting at a bar. Uh, <laughs> but, and I just said, okay, I've got to have this work too. So um, yeah, honestly, this one at the bar is just, yeah, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's extraordinary. And so I'm really happy, you know, he, when I actually met Basil, he, he was not, I don't know if he was still making this work, but I know he was showing his quilting work, uh, which is also beautiful. Uh, but once again, I have uh, challenges just in terms of wall space. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I said to him and actually one of his gallerists, I said, you know, yeah, I think you should really do more of these works. And he's actually has a, a new series of work coming out, which are a bit larger than, than these, but it's the kind of the collage slash basil i apologize if i'm if i'm screwing up the uh the uh description of 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 your works but it's kind of collage um that has then been photographed and placed on a a hard substance uh and it's a unique work i mean i just this is his his work is extraordinary i'm, I'm just really excited uh about the new body of work as well yeah me too <laughs> um, so I'm going to stop sharing. Um, okay, let's dive back into some of these questions. Sure. Uh, let's see. Do you have a favorite story? This is from Jessica Solomon. Um, every acquisition has a story. What's your favorite? Thank you for that question, Jessica. Wow. Um, all the stories are different. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite. Uh, you know, I always like it when I get a, when I think I'm getting a deal, uh, whatever that means, um, <laughs> or, or a deal from the perspective, not necessarily in terms of price, but just access, right. Or it's different. Um, so I was very excited, for example, the acquisition of my Kennedy ankle, uh, tabletop work, uh, mm -hmm. because it was kind of in an auction that no one was really kind of paying attention to, at least from my perspective. Um, the uh, story I told about basically, you know, the opportunistic acquisition of a work by Lena Iris Victor. I was not looking to acquire one of her works. She was an artist that I have admired for quite some time, but didn't think that um, I had the ability to acquire one of her works. And so uh, when that opportunity uh, just presented itself to me, I, I jumped on it, uh, even though I wasn't in the in the market of, of, of acquiring work uh, at, at that point. Um, actually, one of my favorite stories, and this is not about an acquisition, but um, Mary Sabatino from Gallery Le Long, Mother's Day weekend last year, I was in New York visiting my daughter and uh, Leonardo Drew was, uh, his exhibition at the gallery was going up. And so she invited me to stop by on a Saturday, the gallery was closed. Uh, my daughter lived in the, in the gallery district just to come by and see the installation of the exhibition. And so we, Sydney and I went by thinking, and I was thinking that in fact, um, they would just be hanging work on the walls, but actually they were doing that, but he was also there doing a site specific uh, work installation, which uh, started on the floor. And then, you know, two hours later, uh, you know, it, it was it was going up on the wall, and so it was just extraordinary seeing his process 
because I said, you know, how can he see this? It's like a million pieces on the floor. And, uh, you know, and it, and it was coming together in the gallery. It wasn't something that he had done in the studio and then pulled off his walls to then reinstall in the gallery. So just to see the, that thought process and to be there kind of in the middle of it, in the yeah. middle of all of these things on the floor and, you know, iron, you know, steel beams and, you know, drills. And I mean, it was, it was, that was an extraordinary afternoon. And, and, and actually, uh, it's not about an acquisition, but that afternoon, my daughter said to me, and she had been in New York for nine years at that point, she said, you know, I, I never knew that you could just walk into these galleries. I thought you needed an invitation. And I'm like, oh, no, wow. they want you to walk in the galleries. And so uh, Hauser and Wirth had the exhibition up of Lorna Simpson, um, mm -hmm. the works from Ebony and Jet. And I just, remember my daughters, they had one image that you actually had to walk into the gallery and then you made a left uh, and they had this huge image of the wall on the wall. And I just remember seeing my daughter's face as she looked at that image. And I just said, okay, I think she now gets it. I think she's yeah. now like, like, you know, jumped in now full body <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, understanding, you know, what drives us to go to art fairs and the museums all the time. Um, so I may change gears just a little here. Um, hmm. Do you feel institutions outside of major cities are starting to reevaluate their depiction of art history and or thinking about adding African-American artists to their collections or to the dialogue that they're having in general? That question is from David Israel. Thank you, David, for your question. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, we, we have enjoyed um, some extraordinary exhibitions that we just stumbled across in some very unlikely places. We were in, in Lisbon and there was an exhibition um, in a, uh, you know, small mu museum that was part of a, uh, of a, um, a monument. And it was all about kind of the history of the slave trade and black folks in that region of the world. And the imagery was incredible. And it wasn't like we were just kind of, you know, searching for it. I don't know if that's a small, you know, and also we had, we were in Bologna, Italy last year and saw an extraordinary ex exhibition of African artifacts along with works from um, artists, contemporary works of artists from the, from the continent in some like small museum on the side of the road <laughs> um, off a of square. Uh, one of the museums in, in Kansas City, I believe, did an exhibition a couple years ago of female artists. Um, I wouldn't necessarily consider that, that market to be a, a major urban market, but the exhibition they had there, which included um, a couple artists I own, uh, Nanette Carter and Deborah Dancy, but also, you know, Mary Sabatino had been talking to me about um, Mildred Thompson, and so Mildred Thompson's work mm. was there. You know, <laughs> Gilda Snowden, um, uh, Candida Alvarez. Uh, I mean, just, I mean, it was, it's an extraordinary, it was an extraordinary exhibition that really should have traveled mm. around the country. Uh, there's a book, I think it's called, uh, I don't know, I can't remember the name of the book, but <laughs> the cover of the book has a work by Mildred Thompson on the cover. Um, that's a, it's kind of a small market I would characterize, or a mid-sized market museum. Uh, that took a real big step out, I would think, given its market uh, to highlight the work of African American abstract female artists, which, you know, if you string all those words together, that is a small group that should be a lot larger from my perspective. So, um, yeah, so I, you know, I think that uh, works by artists from the diaspora is, you know, there, there's a broader market interest in it today. Uh, but when my friends started collecting works in the 80s and 90s and even the early 2000s, it was collection, collections that were being built because they loved the work mm -hmm. versus, it, versus it being popular. And so mm -hmm. when I started buying work, I mean, the first kind of real piece of, quote unquote, real piece of art that I acquired as an adult was 
a work by Andy Warhol. He is not African-American, but it was an image of Muhammad Ali. So I loved the work, yeah. I loved the image. And so I think there are probably different, more reasons people are collecting black, quote unquote, black art now, mm -hmm. but that doesn't negate the interests of collectors who are collecting the work because they love the work. Yeah, for sure. So that makes me have my own question um, about what you think in terms of changing the dialogues and the ways that uh, art of the diaspora is represented in museum collections and in these exhibitions, do you think that collectors play a role in that at all? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I think, uh, for example, the, um, the, the exhibition that opened and then quickly closed, but it's being just, uh, extended at the MCA in Chicago, that's curated by Duro Oulu. Uh, I mean, you know, you would walk through that exhibition and there are 300 plus works of work of arts from Chicago area museums and also Chicago area collectors. The, the, the work of, of artists from the diaspora are, is probably overrepresented based mm -hmm. on kind of the percentage population in, in Cook County. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that, you know, it, it just, it just really, uh, was very, really very heartened when I walked into MoMA a few months ago and saw a Ed Clark work hanging next to a Jackson Pollock work, mm -hmm. as opposed to Ed Clark being hung with other black artists. Yeah. You know, so I think, uh, you know, slowly but surely, and it's really quite frankly, the influence of the curators of the African-American and, and uh, other Latinx curators that are really pushing uh, just, I think, really placing artists where they need to be placed with their peers. Um, I, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing more of that. Uh, the, 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 the exhibition that um, closed the weekend that we went on shelter in place in Chicago, but this is in Detroit, um, Detroit collects art by African-American artists from the homes of Detroit collectors. Mm -hmm. I would say probably 90% of the collectors were African-American. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that was, it, it was an extraordinary exhibition that, um, I don't know if it'll be extended, but certainly the exhibition catalog is available. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's really something worth seeing. Awesome. I, I, I saw it twice and was headed back a third time before. <laughs> Uh, we got this, but we got the shelter in place order, so we did never made it. Right. Yeah. Um, so we do have quite a lot more questions, um, but I think this may be a good place to to end it. Okay. Well, so I thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Oh well, listen. No, it, it's my pleasure. Thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. This has been fun. I didn't really know what to expect, and uh, this is my first fun Zoom uh, uh, <laughs> conference. I've been on Zoom for work, so. That's a great way to end the week. Thank you so much. And Thank thanks you. everybody for joining us. Really And yes, it. of course. Thank you everyone for joining us. I am Nayama, which I realized I didn't say at the beginning. <laughs> so hello to all of you who don't know me. And this is the first time you've ever seen my face. We'll be back again next week, Friday at 3 p.m. on Zoom. Expect that information of who our guests will be soon. Thanks so great. much. Have a great oh. weekend. Well, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.